фестиваля, а также для представления а, серии мастер-классов и презентаций ведущих спикеров форума. А, позвольте представить вам а, для торжественного слова руководителя Департамента природопользования и охраны окружающей среды города Москвы Антона Олеговича Кувальчевского. Пожалуйста, встречайте. Доброе утро, уважаемые друзья. Я извиняюсь за свой голос, слегка простужен. Я думаю, наоборот, он будет звучать более спокойно. И, наверное, тот эмоциональный тон, который я хочу в своем выступлении вступительном задать, он будет несколько сглажен. Коллеги, вы, наверное, все знаете, что в Москве работает новая команда под руководством мэра Сергея Семеновича Собянина. Уже за три года сделано очень много, но как раз проходящий сейчас в Москве урбанистический форум – участниками которого мы с вами тоже являемся, он показал, что, конечно, Москве нужна стратегия. Нужна стратегия градостроительная, нужна стратегия транспортная, в том числе, если говорить об экологической стратегии, она перекликается, ну, скажем так, с путями развития города. Поэтому сейчас, конечно, такая серьезная задача стоит перед нашим департаментом. Мэр поставил, президент России поставил задачу сформировать в Российской Федерации новую экологическую политику. Поэтому мы в Москве тоже этим очень сильно озадачены. Работаем с экспертами, изучаем международный опыт, с учеными, с политиками, с жителями, в том числе жители очень активное участие принимают в формировании новой экологической политики. Ну и необходимо отметить, вот мы с вами сегодня находимся на, скажем так, на территории пока еще промзоны, но я надеюсь, что в ближайшие 3-4-5 лет эта промзона преобразится. Это будет, наверное, таким пилотным проектом как раз по реконструкции, реорганизации промзон. Сергей Семенович на городостроительном форуме отметил, что Москва – это постиндустриальный город. Это на самом деле так. Я думаю, что здесь очень много молодежи, и пройдет совсем немного времени, и вы будете жить в совсем другом городе. И понятие о Москве как о транспортно-пересадочном узле, либо об индустриальном городе уйдет в прошлое, Город станет комфортным для жизни, он станет здоровым и открытым для людей. Вот, наверное, основной постулат, такой идеалистический, который в будущем все те усилия и те стратегии, которые в Москве сейчас будут приняты и действуют, к чему, к какому результату они должны привести. Ну и, наверное, мы уже с точки зрения охраны окружающей среды тоже уходим только от формулы ее охраны, а говорим о том, что будущее любого мегаполиса, чтобы стать привлекательным, чтобы стать более чистым с экологической точки зрения, конечно, необходимо внедрять новые технологии. И мы готовы, Москва готова к внедрению этих технологий, у нас для этого есть все. И потенциал, и желание, и мы четко понимаем, в какой сфере и где какие технологии нам надо применить. Поэтому экология и экономика – это, наверное, та формула, которая в ближайшие десятилетия все-таки будет будоражить умы всех прогрессивных московских экологов. Мы говорим о том, что экологам надо становиться экономистами для того, чтобы экология и экономика, вот эта вот формула, она, ну, скажем так, была реализована в городе. Я не буду сегодня... Ваше время сильно занимать, потому что у нас очень интересные спикеры, будут прочитаны очень интересные лекции. Я думаю, вы все получите очень большую пользу, потому что я послушал, допустим, первый раз лекцию Яна Гейла, но она мое сознание перевернула. Несмотря на то, что мне уже за 40, все-таки считается, да, что уже мозги, наверное, не совсем такие гибкие, не совсем такой текучий ум, как у, у молодежи, да, но тем не менее... У меня в голове произошла революция. Я на свой родной город теперь смотрю совсем по другим ракурсам, по другим углом. И хотелось бы, чтобы вы, послушав эти лекции, эти выступления, тоже максимальную пользу из этого извлекли и поменяли, может быть, 
частицу своего мировоззрения, может быть, какие-то взгляды, потому что это очень важно. А нашим спикерам вам есть о чем рассказать. Они очень опытные, известные люди. Я думаю, что не буду ваше время отнимать, и а предоставлю слово им. Спасибо. Уважаемые друзья, сейчас вашему вниманию представит презентацию, посвященную исследованиям общественных пространств города Москвы датский архитектор, профессор, специалист в области урбанистики и городского дизайна Ян Гейл. Maybe I would like to correct the Dutch architect. I'm Danish from Denmark. That's a little bit of difference, a thousand kilometer. <clears throat> I shall tell about that today cities are competing about livability. They are not competing about which city can have the most traffic or whatever, they are very much competing on the quality of life. And as far as I can see, having a people-oriented city planning strategy is a very sure way to achieve a more livable city. I shall tell you the story. How does this work? Thank you. I shall tell you first the story of my life in a very short version. I graduated as an architect in 1960. I was trained as a good modernist that the best thing in the world would be high-rise standing out on the fields. <clears throat> and I was trained to do things like this and I rushed out of School of Architecture to do these kind of things. Then I married a psychologist. And at, at once we had all these questions. Why are you architects not interested in people? Why don't you architects know anything about people? And that, of course, I was a young person, so that really struck me as something very interesting. So I had to go back to School of Architecture where I stayed for another 40 years to study more about people and realized that my education was not so good. I did a number of books in this period, and I'm very proud that these books are all over the world. Um, and uh, all my books are, and I'm very proud of that, all my books are translated into Chinese. And I know that they have them over there because I've signed all of them. But the bad thing about it is that they have not yet had Sorry. They haven't had time to read them yet. So it still looks like this, but maybe one day. Then, when I was an old guy, we started a company to make livable cities. And, and in just 12 years, we've been a company. We have worked from one end of the world to the other. And I shall tell later on a little bit about the work we have done here in Moscow, which has been a great joy for myself and my team to work with this city, which are so ambitious and have such fine people uh, leading it. Um, recently, I did another book called Cities for People. It's out in many funny languages, including Russian and Greek. I told the Greeks, don't, don't, don't translate my book. Don't use your money for that. You, don't, you haven't got much money, so you should not publish my book. But then they said, no, no, don't worry. We get the money from the Danish embassy. So they published it. Um, in this book, I tell about the two major paradigms which has dominated city planning for the last 50 years. One has been the paradigm of modernism where things started to be done from up above and 
um, it started really out in the big way in 1960 when the city started to grow very fast and to do these big planning schemes you had to have an overview so you started to put down the buildings like this so the whole thing was seen from an aeroplane and the site plans was sort of done but from a helicopter but no people were looking after where the people were there was no profession to look after the people there were uh, planners and, and site plan architects to do the two upper scales, but the little scale was completely overlooked. <clears throat> At that time, in 1960, when all this started, we did not know anything about how the physical environment influenced the life of people. But now we know that there is a fantastic influence whatever we do has great consequences for the quality of life. We, we know now that we form the cities, but then the cities form our lives. The other big change of paradigm which happened around 1960 was the invasion of the motor car, which happened in all the Western countries. It happened a bit later here, but it was it was very serious here also. When the motor cars invaded, they at once occupied all the spaces in the cities and they came to, the, the motor car came to structure all the new districts also in these 50 years of time. We do now definitely have a new paradigm. We have a shift of paradigm. It's shifting from quantity to quality. And today, today, all cities I know of, they want to be lively and livable. They want to be safe. They realize that they must be sustainable. And also, they must invite their citizens to a healthy lifestyle. The moment you have no life, you have a lifeless city and it's sort of a dead city, you realize that you, you have lost a very valuable quality, that is the ability to meet your fellow citizens, that to see how society works with your own eyes, to meet other people, to look at the girls and all that. People are the greatest interest in our life. Also, we realize that if it's a people-oriented city, it's a safer city to move in, and also a safer city, uh, you experience it as safer. Increasingly, we realize that we must make cities much more sustainable. Some of the major problems for the climate challenge comes from the cities, so it's in the cities that we have to address the climate um, uh, question. And of course, if more people walk more and bicycle more and use more public transportation, that will be very good for the emission and good for the health also. And there's an interesting link between good public transportation and good public realm, because to have a good public transportation, you should have a, a, a very good way to go there, to go to the bus stop or the, or the train station and to go back at all times of day and night. So good public transportation and good public room, they're brothers and sisters. Finally, we have now a very serious new challenge to our cities, that is the health problem that more people now die of bad city planning than die of smoking cigarettes. And the bad city planning is the city planning which invites people to be inactive from early morning to late night. You sit in the house, you sit in the car, you sit in the office, you sit in the car, and you sit in the house, and you can spend the whole life sitting. Un unless you take the escalator to the fitness center three times a week, but, but that is not a strategy which has worked. A few people do that, but most of them, they just sit and sit. And we realize that we can build into city planning such a way that people walk and bicycle as part of their daily day, and that is by far the best health policy and gives much lower health budget 
and give you a longer life and a lower budget uh, for the f fewer hospitals and, and a better quality of life, fewer pills, fewer visits to the doctor. There are so many advantages of moving every day. So the doctors say you should move one hour a day moderately. You shall walk or you shall bicycle for one hour and you can live seven extra years and have much less problems with your health. So we realize now that we in the city planning must address the question of making, inviting for, for healthy lifestyles. That's why many cities today, they have this, this kind of, of goal that in this city we'll do everything we can so that people will walk and bicycle as much as possible in the course of the daily day. It's not only about making something in the weekend, it's really something about Monday, Tuesday through to Friday that you have activity built into your ordinary program. I shall show you now quickly some cities which have started on this way, which is also the way now we realize towards being much more livable city. My hometown of Copenhagen in Denmark was one of the very first which 50 years ago they started to create better conditions for walking. They pushed the traffic out of the main streets. They cleared all the squares for parking and turned them gradually. This city was transformed from a car-oriented city to a people-oriented city. Copenhagen was also the first city in the world where not only the traffic was studied, so tra traffic engineers, they count all the cars every year. In Copenhagen, we started to, to record the life, the use of the city, how people use the city, and we could prove that every time you made better quality for people, there would be more people walking, more people sitting, more people having a good time, and that came to influence the policy of the city very much. We were able to prove a lot of things that you actually, through your city planning, can invite people to use the city much more and have much more fun in the city. Also in Copenhagen, gradually, it was not only a matter of making the center of the city a very nice place, but now they have a policy of making the city a good place for pedestrians, for walking all over the city. The streets used all of them to be asphalt, 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 but now they have trees and they have medians and they have only one lane in either direction and they have bicycle lanes and it's a much safer street and it's a much more beautiful street and it can almost take the same number of cars as the old street. Copenhagen now have an official policy. We will be the best city for people in the world before 2025. Also in Copenhagen, they've had for many years a very distinct bicycle policy. The whole city is covered by a citywide network of good bicycle lanes with curbs to this traffic and curbs to the, to the sidewalk. And this has turned into a complete transport network. You can transport anything on bicycles. Every third family in Copenhagen had a cargo bike so they can bring their kids around. And the children love much more cargo bike than sitting strapped at the rear of the car. Also, they've done a lot to make it safer. They have special bicycle crossings, they have special bicycle lights. They have a number of features to make bicycling safer, and bicycling now is very safe. It has developed over the years into a culture so that everybody bicycles, the businessmen, the pregnant mothers, the children. And by now, Copenhagen is in the situation that 37% of everybody who go to work, they arrive on the bicycle. And that means that there are much less traffic than in any other city of a million and a half in Western Europe. And uh, they also continue in the winter, some of them. 
Copenhagen also has this other policy, we will be the best city for bicycles by 2025. And they do a lot to achieve this goal. So they are very walking and bicycle friendly in the city of Copenhagen. And when we had the new government two years ago, the government, the new ministers, they took their bikes and went up to the castle to the Queen to get their commissions as ministers. They asked the, the guards to look after the bicycles while they went in and talked to the Queen. And that was made all of us very proud that we have a government like that. No limousines, no more. Next day they were all in limousines, but that's another story. Um, this year, Copenhagen was named the most livable city in the world. It has been made, named livable city several times, and I see that there is a strong link between this very people-oriented policy and the high degree of quality of life which you can have in Copenhagen. Sometimes I've told you about that I've been married for more than 50 years, and in all those 50 years I have the feeling that every morning when I woke up, the city was a little bit better than it was yesterday. And that's a fantastic thing to be living in a city where every day is a little bit better. There are so many cities where every day in the morning it's a little bit worse than it was yesterday. But not so in this city, and this is very livable. Could that happen in other parts of the world? Yes, indeed it can. I've had the pleasure to work with the city of Melbourne in Australia, which is just an ordinary modern city. And it was famous for being very dull and uninteresting and full of traffic and uh. They had a very deliberate policy of being, making the city better for people. And um, I've been involved over 25 years and in this period, the city has become a really nice city. It's one of the nicest cities in the world. It's got wide sidewalks, it's got good quality furniture on the streets, it's got trees, um, it's got art in the streets. It's such a nice city. They have the policy, in this city, we walk. And over the time, Melbourne has become almost like Paris. It's a wonderful city but it's better than Paris because the climate is better. Also, it has been found and proved in Melbourne that if you are people friendly in the city, it's good for the economy. All the economic factors are up. A little bit north of Sydney, so Melbourne is another city which always competed with Melbourne, that's Sydney. And um, they were very worried to see Melbourne becoming a very nice city, and Sydney was not. So they came and said, could, could you help us to, Mel to Melbourneize Sydney? That was not easy for them to say that word. But Sydney is very famous for an, an Olympics and a number of things, had a nice waterfront. But the city centre in Sydney is very poor. But now they are full speed changing it. Um, the, all the traffic will be pushed out of the main street and there will be light rail, bicycles and pedestrians. They have already started and this is well on its way. Also they are doing bicycle system all over the city. They are not so quick in, in Sydney, but there's one thing they are very good to, uh, in Sydney, that's printing posters. So the whole city is full of green posters saying that we will be green, we will be sustainable. Here you shall walk, here you shall bicycle. And I think it's very good that the city council tells the people that we are on that track and what we are doing is for making a better world for everyone, Sydney. Here is the latest list of the most livable cities in the world. And it's interesting that Copenhagen and Melbourne are number one and two. They are always among the best five in all these lists. But you can also see in Sydney and other Sydney cities which are actually, which have a very people-oriented policy, they are among 
the 10 most livable in the world. There is a connection here. Another city which really have decided to do something about it is the city of New York, where the mayor Bloomberg, who is just about to leave now, he's been there for 12 years, but in 2007, 2007 he said, I will promise every the world that New York will be the most sustainable metropole in the world in no time. They had one million cars coming into Manhattan every day. He said, we don't need those cars. They can go by metro or they can go by bicycle. We have wide streets. We can make a good bicycle system. And then they set forth to do all this. Um, these, they had sidewalks and they were full of people, but they were only walking from the metro to the office and back. No benches, no seats, no sidewalk cafes, just shuffling around. Also, the bicycle situation was not very glorious. They had a poster about the bicycle situation, and that was not very good. But they set out to solve these problems about being a good city for walking and for bicycling very, very fast. And being Americans, they started at once to implement a system of, I think it's four or five thousand kilometer of bicycle lanes all over New York, in Manhattan, and in all the boroughs. Um, so all over New York, they are now implementing and the number of bicyclists are going up like this. Also, they realized that they should have better public spaces, which was a joy to be in. They could not say to everybody who got tired, you can go down in Central Park, it's four kilometers that way, because people get tired and they want to enjoy the city right where they are. And where are they in New York? They are on Times Square, on Madison Square, Union Square, Hill Square, they are on the squares along Broadway. And then it was decided that maybe we can take Broadway out of circulation. And then in 2000 and, come on now, here we are. Then in 2008 and nine, it was decided to close Broadway in three, four important spaces. One of them being Times Square. This is Times Square in the spring. And this is Times Square in the summer of 2009. The mayor, he said, oh no, it's only an experiment, don't worry. Um, and then half a year later, he came out and said, experiment, no way. It's the biggest success in the history, in the recent history of city planning in New York. These closures of Broadway, they will stay because they are a very big success. Also, New York has got in Singapore the prize last year as the most, uh, the finest city in the world. So doing something for people is something which makes, which are known. This is a little bit of background because this, what we have been doing here and what Moscow is doing can be seen in the link of these other cities, um, which are all of them working towards being more livable. I shall tell you a little bit about our work in Moscow. It started two years ago, precisely. It started at the Urban Forum in 2011, where I was asked by Mayor Subyanin to um, undertake a study and some recommendations along the lines of what we have done in London and Sydney and Melbourne and New York and um, but these are some pictures I took two years ago. Some of the pictures I could also take today. But this shows some of the situation. And this is a picture of, of Tverskaya sidewalk two years ago at Christmas time. Then, the first thing which happened was that all my books were at once translated into Russian. And it was done by the city of Moscow. And in this case, I personally made sure that they read them. 
the man who is, who's, who's uh, worried out, it, that's the Danish ambassador, he is worried. The other ones, they look forward maybe. Then we were commissioned to do this study, which was finished in July this year. And all the things I now show relates to study we did a year ago. Already now, quite a few things have changed more or less. These are some of the, this is some of the first pages of this study showing that if you look at Paris, London and New York city centers and you look at the city center of Moscow, it is more or less the same size. Um, between, I think Moscow is 19 square kilometer and the other ones are 22 and 23 square kilometers. So they are quite comparable, these metropole cities of the world. In the case of Moscow, instead of studying the whole city center, we decided to study some selected streets, squares and parks, and also a few places outside the city center. It is, we call this acupuncture study. By studying various parts of the body, you can learn quite a bit about the whole body. And um, maybe I should start by saying that my first reflection here was that, that it's, it's a very nice city. It is a city with many, many qualities. It also is a city with some problems. But basically, I think there are many, many qualities. It has quite a bit of a history and it is reflecting, among other things, in the skyline. It has got the rivers. It's got many parks. It's got, um, it's got a very, very precise uh, street structure. And it's got very interesting historical monuments. It's rather compact and it has this structure, uh, which is very, very interesting on the map. It's not so easy to find the structure in real life because it's all flooded with traffic. It's got a very nice metro system, and it's got cultural life, and it's a lively city in many ways. So there's a number of natural and man-made qualities about this city. But it is really overrun by motor cars, and the cars and the parking, they have taken over many of the spaces in the city. It's very complicated to get around in the city if you're not in a car, and even in a car, it's also complicated. The riverfronts, they are not really celebrated, and um, also there's a number of the qualities which the city has, which, which is sort of, you can't really feel them and see them because it's, it's traffic, all over the place. So this was my impression when I walked around two years ago, and still you can take the same pictures today, that the car is a king, it's all over the place, and it needs to be controlled better, and it is in the process of being controlled better. We used, for this study, we used a number of criteria about to have a good city for people, it should be good to walk, it should be good to get across streets, you should be able to get around if you were in a, in a handicapped or old, there should be possibilities to rest, it should be a safe city, you should be able to talk, the noise level should not be too high, and it should be a, a good city by night. These are some of the criteria, and here, is the first finding, it's a little bit, it's quite complicated to see what this is about. But we found that nobody walks in Moscow. Moscow is a city in the world where the fewest people are walking. I've taken some other cities here. There's London, there's Sydney, uh, there's Rotterdam in Holland. And in all these places, there are much more people on the street than on the most used streets in Moscow, which would be Tverskaya and Arabat. 
are bad. Um, so why are there no people walking? There are many people walking in London, there are many people walking in New York, there are many people walking in, in Paris, but there are no people walking in Moscow. That was interesting. Where are the people? Oh, they are down in the metro. And if you look closer at the pattern of walking in, in Moscow, it's very much like it used to be in New York, that people come out of the metro and run to their office and run back again. So around the metro station, there's a lot of people, but nobody is promenading from one end of the city to the other, which is interesting. And also it's a sign of a city of not too good a quality. You don't really are invited to make long promenades when the situation is so complicated. So this is something which is interesting here around around the metro stations you are crowded and there's a lot of people but between them there are very few people there are interesting that in Tverskaya in the winter and Tverskaya in the summer same number of people that means that in the summer nobody uh, promenades up and down the main street um, they just go to their office as in the winter um, there are very little space, so pedestrians have a number of things which makes it uninteresting to walk. There's very little space. There is a lot of obstacles on the sidewalks. Uh, the quality of the sidewalks are not too good. And getting across in the, in, the, in the pedestrian crossings are many places a big problem because of parked cars. And then there are the underpasses uh, that it's very difficult to get across the street because from the communistic times, and that is something which is characteristic, characteristic for all cities in the Soviet era, that they made, they, they didn't like people to cross streets, they liked them to go in tunnels to get out of the way. But having tunnels is not a very smart thing because the traffic can go faster and People hate stairs all over the world, and handicapped people cannot really use these. And also, children with, with people with children. So there's a number of constrictions. So all over the world now, they are abolishing the underground tunnels and making on great pedestrian crossings, even in big streets. In Charles LEC, they have no. They, they, will pour, they pass on the grade, but here in Moscow you have to go under and go a long st stretch to find the next tunnel, and sometimes you have to go great detours to get to where you have to go, and then you can go to St. Petersburg and go to Nevsky Prospect. The first thing you find in Nevsky Prospect is there are four times more people walking in St. Petersburg than are in Tverskaya in Moscow. The other thing is they don't have tunnels because they are built on a swamp. So if they dig tunnel, there will be water in the tunnel. I, I'm so sorry that you don't have water and a swamp here because then you could just cross. That would be much better. And I can see in the future we will have a day when you could, you could have a city boulevard where you can just cross to the other side when you need and you will have a number of things in the streets, so it is more comfortable. Um, another thing about, uh, about Moscow is that there are very few places where you can sit and rest and enjoy, um, even on our bed. And there are very few sidewalk cafes or places where you can do recreational activities, and they are concentrated in a few side streets uh, whatever. Compared to other cities, it's a very um, poor situation. Also, we, we found, of course, that it is a very grey city, that many streets are complete without trees, and compared with a number of other cities, I've just been in Almaty in Kazakhstan, it's completely green, all streets have lots of trees, here it's very grey. 
In New York, they are, pl- they are promising to plant one million new trees in the streets. In Melbourne, they plant 500 new street trees a year. And here, it's about to start. I'm quite sure. Um, going around, and the first time in Moscow for two years ago, I was astonished to see how ugly a lumber of places were, full of uncoordinated signs and commercials, and I don't know what. And also, I think that a little design could be needed for some of the outdoor cafes. They, they look like, like a circus tent or something like that. Um, so, now, finally, to the riverbanks, which I said is a very fine quality about Moscow. But then, when you look at the riverbanks, all the riverbanks, mostly, actually, 93% of the riverbanks and the canal banks in Moscow is used for parking and traffic. If you look at other great cities like Paris, like London, like New York, you can see that they have, all of them, changed or in the process of changing their riverbanks into a very nice recreational asset, uh, an advantage for the city, so that the rivers in these cities are celebrated. That's interesting. So now, what to do? This little, this little graph shows it all. Today, the city is full of cars, actually far too many cars. You can't change this from one day to the other, but you could have a policy over a number of years to reduce the need to take to co- have commuter cars. And we can envisage a city where you walk much more, which is much greener, And also, we have this idea that we need a surface transportation system so that whenever you have to go from one end of Moscow to the other in the center, you don't have to go 100 meters down in the ground and take the metro one station and go up again, but that you could actually have a light rail system running in the very wide streets so that people could be brought around in the center on the surface and we could use the metro for the long distance runs to the suburbs. The metro is very close to capacity and that could relieve the metro and we could use the metro to bring people into the city instead of internally in the city. So we envisage that a system of light rail can be introduced. So here are some of the things. We think that these qualities which the city has should be celebrated. Celebrate that you have all these nice green areas. Celebrate the waterfronts. Let Let us clean up so you can really experience the structure. Um, keep the keep the low profile. I, I actually think that the six or seven sisters are part, of course, of history now. And so we shall keep high-rise outside. That is fine. And then we shall do more about the riverbanks. Here is the existing traffic system, a lot of cars, and then deep below a metro and a poor little man who is jumping for life. I would like this thing to be, to be made into a 21st century traffic system where bicycles and walking people are giving a high priority that we have good surface transportation plus the metro, that we have taxis and deliveries, and then if we have more room, we can have private cars going to work 20 years or 15 years or 10 years from now. Here are some, here are some uh, diagrams showing some of the principles which I have more or less told you. And instead of having this system where people just come up of the metro and go 200 meters and back again, we would like that the city is made in such a good quality that it would be a joy to walk one, two, three kilometers as they can do in all the other good metropoles of the world. It is a very smart way of getting around in the city. It's good for the hills and it's just 
um, a coincidence that it cannot really happen yet at this point, but it can easily be made so. So, yeah. And this is some other, that is something about beautifying the city and, and having, using the amenities and the qualities which are there in the first place. We do suggest that Tverskaya be celebrated properly. It runs from Kremlin all the way up to Belarus station. And it has throughout the history been the main street and it's now a freeway, but it could again be developed and celebrated. And I can see Tverskaya with a lot of trees, with light rail, with wide sidewalks, and with not so much traffic as, it, as today. And also level crossings. Also, I would suggest that the pedestrian streets be upgraded so there are benches and that the visual quality and the tree situation is addressed so they will be wonderful places to stay and to walk. And then comes the river banks where we, we pointed out that a great portion of them were not accessible, but of course in a policy it should be so that more and more of the river banks are being made for people and not only to make the cars and traffic happy. So this more or less and this is, of course, a big report, which we use much time to do. It is also translated into Russian, or rather it's made in Russian. And it was presented in July this year. And now comes a little extra part, because already in July, when I was here, and during our work, we have seen things happening. Um, I could just show you this picture here. At one point, I had a meeting with Mr. Sobyanin, and we discussed uh, some of the things, and he said, what might you suggest? And I said that, oh, maybe the parking on the sidewalk of Tuskaya is not the smartest idea I ever saw in any major cities. And then, three months later, wow, there were no parking on Tuskaya, and then, of course, I realized that if you forget your car on Tverskaya, it is being gently picked up and brought to Siberia, I think. <laughs> and you think this is inhuman? It's very human, because it's much worse in, in Vilnius, where the mayor go around in a tank, and if you park in a bicycle lane, you have a problem. So, this thing, this thing in Moscow, that's very gentle, actually. And here, which to me is a miracle. This is Tverskaya two years ago, and this is Tverskaya a year and a half later. Gone are the parked cars, now there are room for people. There are benches all the way down, there are flowers, and there are trees, different trees for different seasons. And many of the advertisements has disappeared. So now at the end of the street, you can see Kremlin and enjoy some of the nice historic parts of the city. To me, this is a miracle. I've shown these pictures around the world and they clap their hands and say, fantastic, well done. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. Um, these pictures will be in the next issue of British Airways in Flight magazine, Moscow on the road. This is a square in front of the town hall two years ago and this summer. And even the bicycles have appeared in Moscow. To me, it's a miracle. Now we only need a bicycle infrastructure and we are there. So, while I was sitting in Copenhagen and then suddenly these pictures dropped into me showing that this little humble project was being displayed publicly on the streets of Moscow. And I think that's a very nice gesture and that's a very nice sign of a city on the move. 
And I shall end here by congratulating the mayor. Among other mayors now, we have one more mayor who is thinking about making the city more livable day by day. I wish Moscow all the best of luck and I congratulate what has happened and there are quite a few other things which have to be addressed. Welcome. Sorry, what happened here? Welcome to the 21st century. Thank you. Большое спасибо Яну Гейлу за интересную презентацию. А сейчас а, в холле нашего выставочного зала а, там начнется а, автограф-сессия книги Яна Гейла, в рамках которой он также ответит на ваши вопросы. А, уважаемые друзья, прошу а, не забывать оставлять устройство для синхронного перевода, когда вы покидаете зал. Также позвольте обратить ваше внимание, что сейчас в лаунж-зоне, которая находится на втором этаже, начнется доклад «Ландшафтное проектирование в городе Москве. Проблемы состояния пути развития» президента Ассоциации ландшафтных архитекторов России Таисии Иосифовны Вольф Тру. Также через 10 минут в этом зале Серия лекций будет продолжена специалистом из Великобритании Брайаном Эвансом. А в лектории, где находятся желто-зеленые пуфики, через 10 минут состоится лекция-воркшоп «Маркетинг местности» Илья Палакина.